Welcome everyone. I'm Clark and I'm the producer of this channel. I'm from Lehigh, Utah. I started Study My Gospel to provide another resource of online gospel learning. I partner with professional gospel instructors for our various series, including Come Follow Me, Gospel Topics, and more to come. If you like the content, please subscribe. Enjoy the video. Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes as we look at 3 Nephi chapter 8 through 11. In 1976 at 3.42 a.m. on July 28th, the Chinese city of Tangshan was rocked by a 7.8 magnitude earthquake. It was an industrial city, had a population of about a million, and the official death toll was a staggering 255,000 people. Another 700,000 were injured. More recently, a magnitude 9.3 earthquake struck underneath the ocean floor, underneath the ocean. The resulting tsunami uh, is estimated to have killed between 230,000 and 280,000 people. In Indonesia, the tsunami wave reached 98 feet in height. One of the most tragic hurricanes was a Category 4 that arrived in Galveston in 1900. It came in the night of September 8, 1900. They knew a storm was coming, but they didn't know how bad it was. It was Texas's most advanced city at the time, and it was pretty much nearly destroyed. One young man later said, quote, We knew there's a storm coming, but we had no idea that it was as bad as it was. William Mason Bristol was 21 at the time and was living in his mom's house, in his mom's boarding house, as he w watched and listened to the destruction happen that night. In 34 AD, there were many deaths in the Americas by tempests and whirlwinds, opening the earth to receive individuals. Cities were destroyed, mountains were, were made low, valleys were raised. Those things were prophesied by the prophet Zenus. And also Zenek prophesied concerning these things. As a matter of fact, in the 34th year, the Nephites adjusted their cal calendar so as to begin a new dating era with the birth of Jesus. And according to their chronology, the darkness, the storms, the crucifixion came to pass on the fourth day of the first month in the 34th year. And then at the ending of that year, now that's 3 Nephi 10, 18, 19, Several months after the ascension uh, on, from the Mount of Olives, Christ spent many hours and many days teaching and being among the Nephites. These tremendous convulsions of nature not only impressed the Nephites greatly, so they recorded them in their history, but the memory of them also stayed in the minds of Lamanites or the American Indians for 1,500 years. Shortly after the discovery of America, the Catholic missionaries and explorers learned that the American Indians had a tradition of the great convulsions of nature that took place at the time of Christ's death. For example, I, now this is President Spencer W. Kimball talking, would like to quote from a Lamanite, an Indian prince named, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce this at all correctly, but it's a coddle. You can read what it is on the quote on the page there. Who lived near the city of Mexico and wrote in his book in 1600 AD, quote, the sun and the moon eclipsed, and the earth trembled, and the rocks broke, and many other things and signs took place. This happened at the same time when Christ our Lord suffered, and they say it happened during the first days of the year. I'm quick to kind of remember President Benson just teaching. The record of the Nephites' history just prior to the Savior's visit reveals many parallels to our own day as we anticipate the Savior's second coming. We see the signs of the times happening. There are things that will happen that will remind us of what happens among Nephites. Oh, we hope there's not a storm like that, an event like that. But I've wondered if I knew that the Savior's coming was going to happen tomorrow. There are phrases in the in Third Nephi that I think are very descriptive. For some, after the storms, they began to look with great earnestness for Christ's coming. They know that it's prophesied after this, these storms, after this, these events, he will come visit. 
and I'm thinking, is that my attitude today? Do I look forward to Christ coming? Or is it like, you know, a little bit later in chapter 8 where it's kind of like, yeah, I don't know that I want Christ to come yet because i got to take care of something. It's all that we'd repent of that. For some, it's a great day. Quite frankly, I look forward to it. For some, it's going to be a terrible day. And what makes the difference? As I read in chapter 8, there were commonalities of, really, here's what makes the difference. Among those who it's terrible, where was wickedness, abominations, they have the blood of the saints and the prophets on their hands. And then I came to chapter 10, verse 12. Quote, and it was the more righteous part of the people who were saved, and it was they who received the prophets. Now, in my reading, I stop there. I know that's in the middle of a sentence. You know, and it finishes out, they received the prophets and stoned them not. But I stopped there and thought, okay, wait. There is something about those who receive the prophets. And what does that mean? How do you receive Christ's prophets? For me, I looked in the context of those verses because I find that a lot of times the context of the verse teaches you how to do what it's just identified, like in this case, receiving Christ's prophets. Really, the prophets have invited us to return to God. How do you receive a prophet? By returning to God. Prophets re I invite us to make a change of our heart, a change of us back to God or repentance. They invite us to be converted. I thought in verse 13 and 14, there are three key ways. If we want to receive a prophet, you just do as they're inviting us to do. Come back to Christ. And then Christ says, really, if you do what these prophets are asking you to do, Christ is saying that I may heal you. I agree with President Harold B. Lee. The greatest miracles I see today are not necessarily the healing of sick bodies, but the greatest miracles I see are the healing of sick souls, who are sick in soul and spirit, are downhearted and distraught, on the verge of nervous breakdowns. We are reaching out to all such, because they are precious in the sight of the Lord, and we want no one to feel that they are forgotten. And then Christ comes and simply says, Come unto me. And he says, my arm of mercy is extended towards you, and whosoever will come, will I receive. I love that, that invitation for us to come to him with a broken heart and a contrite a spirit. And then we become baptized with water and with the spirit. And sometimes we're baptized, and I don't know, sometimes you have to be a little bit careful because that that baptism of fire comes kind of gradually. For like the Lamanites in chapter 9, verse 20, they were baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost, and they knew it not. We must be cautious as we discuss remarkable experiences of conversion. Though they are real and powerful, they are the exception more than the rule. For every Paul, for every Enos, for every King Lamoni, there are hundreds and thousands of people who find the process of repentance much more subtle, much more imperceptible. Day by day, they move closer to the Lord, little realizing they are building a godlike life. They live quiet lives of goodness, service, and commitment. They are like the Lamanites, who the Lord said were baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost, and they knew it not. And I love to kind of picture one of the most beautiful subvert chapters in all of the Book of Mormon, chapter 11. I try and picture myself there. And the voice is heard the first time, and I think, verse 3, they don't hear it. Why don't they hear God's voice? And as a side note, I love what the church has doing, been doing recently with how I hear him. They've had many church leaders just say, here's how I hear him. And one of the things that's kind of a common theme, and it is among the Nephites here, one of the reasons they don't hear him is because their focus is not on him. Their focus is on each other. They're talking with each other. All these great things that have happened, but to hear the Spirit, most of the times we have to focus on the Spirit. The still small voice is so quiet you won't hear it when you're noisy on the inside. And the next verse, they understand it not. I think, why didn't they? Well, now they're paying attention. They're hearing the voice. But understanding the Spirit comes as you listen to and act on the Spirit. It helps you better un understand the Spirit. 
And it's a little bit of a cycle. The more you listen to and act on the Spirit, the more you understand it and the clearer it becomes. And I've been fascinated with the, with the way Christ, as Christ comes, his first words. The Father introduces him. But when Christ speaks, he says, I am the light and the life of the world. I have drunk out of the bitter cup which the Father hath given me, and have glorified the Father in taking upon me the sins of the world. I have suffered the will of the Father in all things from the beginning. That's it. Eight lines. Fifty-two words. And when Jesus had spoken these words, the whole multitude fell to the earth. I thought often about that moment in Nephite history, and I cannot think it was either accident or mere whimsy that the good shepherd in his newly exalted state, appearing in the most significant segment of his flock, chooses to speak first of his obedience, his deference, his loyalty, and loving submission to his father. An initial and profound moment of spellbinding wonder, when surely he has an attention of every man, woman, and child, as far as the eye can see, his submission to his Father is the first and most important thing he wishes us to know about himself. Frankly, I'm a bit haunted by the thought that this is the first and most important thing he may want to, us to know. That when we meet him one day in a similar fashion, did we obey, even if it was painful? Did we submit, even when the cup was bitter indeed? Did we yield to a vision higher and holier than our own, even when we may have seen no vision in it at all? No amount of education or any other kind of desirable or civilizing experience in this world will help us at the moment of our confrontation with Christ if we have not been able and are not then able to yield all that we are, all that we have, been, have and all that we ever hope to have to the Father and to the Son. I love what Elder Holland wrote about this just pivotal event, this central event of the Book of Mormon. He said, the appearance of the resurrected Lord to the Nephites and his declaration of his Messiahship constitute the focal point, the supreme moment in the entire history of the Book of Mormon. It was the manifestation and decree that it informed and inspired every Nephite prophet for the previous 600 years. Everyone had talked of him, sung of him, dreamt of him, and prayed for his appearance. But here he actually was, the day of days. The God who turns every dark night into a morning light had arrived. And you think, what does he do? And I love the theme the way he t in the way he teaches with the phrase one by one. There are four times in his visits to the Nephites where he goes one by one. He wants every individual to have an experience one by one with him. If there are about 2,500 people there who saw and felt his physical body on that occasion, even at three or four seconds each, one by one, would take several hours. The passage we've just read is one of the greatest scriptural records in our possession. It is clear that showing himself involved much more than merely look. It was sight, sound, touch, and a witness of the Spirit. It teaches me that God wants an individualized experience with each one of us. It teaches me that by example, I think God wants us to go out to the one, to the one by one. Even as we give a talk in, I don't know, maybe sometime in my ward these days, in the days of COVID, maybe a sacrament meeting attendance is under 100, or maybe it's 300 later on. But we teach to the one in the multitude. I think that's what Christ did. And it's a great, great way of doing it. And then Christ gets after him. Don't know if you like Calvin and Hobbes, but Calvin's always arguing, well, with the girl. Kind of reminds me, well, you know, sometimes that's what little six and seven-year-olds do. There is contention among them. President Nelson has counseled, as we dread any disease that undermines the health of the body, so we should deplore contention, which is a corroding canker of the spirit. My concern is that contention is becoming accepted as a way of life. From what we see and hear in the media, the classroom, and the workplace, all are now infected to some degree with contention. Well, do I remember a friend who would routinely sow seeds of contention in church classes. His assaults would inevitably be preceded by the predictable comment, Let me play the role of the devil's advocate. Recently he passed away. 
One day he will stand before the Lord in judgment. Then, I wonder, will my friend's predictable comment again be repeated? The commandment to avoid the contention applies to those who are right as well as those who are wrong. It is not enough for the Savior's followers to have a correct understanding of doctrine and procedure. They must be also harmonious in their personal relationships and in the way they seek to serve Him. In the years following Savior's personal ministry to His followers in the American continent, all were converted and enjoyed a golden age of righteousness, peace, and prosperity. I find it significant that the spiritual description of this period stresses that there were no contentions and disputations among them, suggesting that the absence of contention is the most significant bellwether of righteousness. And it enables people to have a correct understanding of doctrine. Don't argue about it. And here's my doctrine. And if you want to have fun, well, the fun's probably not the right way in the classroom, but just ask, what's the doctrine of Christ? You're going to have someone in every classroom, and I think in every family, who's going to nail it. But one thing you may consider to do is, how do you say it most simply and plainly? And I think Christ does. Chapter 11, he just simply states, here's my doctrine. You get it? Verse, end of 31. We can declare my doctrine. Verse 32, this is my doctrine. Repent and believe in me. Verse 33, be baptized. Verse 35, in case you forget, this is my doctrine. Verse 35, believe in me. So believe, repent, baptized. End of verse 35, you'll be visited with fire and with the Holy Ghost. And then verse 37, got to repent, be baptized. Verse 38, repent, be baptized. Verse 39, that's my doctrine. That is the doctrine of Christ. It's simple, yet incredibly powerful. And everything hangs off of the doctrine that really Jesus is the Christ. Now, just a few ideas as, as you teach what I think is probably one of the most powerful chapters in all the Book of Mormon. You know, you may emphasize what are we doing today to receive prophets. But as you focus on 3 Nephi 11, you may choose to do some thought questions that maybe personalize what's happening. And maybe it helps them to get a little bit more into kind of where Christ is at the time. So here's just a few thought questions. Maybe as I go along, you'll be able to see what I'm thinking here. And that's probably not a lot today. What effect did the temple have on their, conver their, their conversation? I mean, think, they're around the temple. How's it affecting what they're talking about? What did you learn about the voice of the Lord? How do you hear him? What do you need to do to hear the voice of God more clearly? What does the Lord do to ensure that we hear his voice? When have I been blessed because I've listened to the voice of the Lord? Now, you could, just, you could be spending those first few verses of chapter 11 a focus on listening to, understanding, and acting on the Spirit. You could also be talking about how have you felt the personal touch of the Savior in your life, one by one. What would you imagine be like to be in the presence of the Savior? And can you imagine being there when Christ calls your name? What would you do? How do covenants like baptism help us develop a relationship with Christ? What do I do to show that I'm living my covenants. You may have an opportunity to teach how I or how you hear him. And I think I mentioned the church's website, comeintochrist.org forward slash hear him. They have great, just different examples of how people today hear him. They have some great ideas. Here's how to hear Christ better in your life and understand the spirit and act on it. Hey, thanks for spending a little bit of time with me as we just talked about some of the key highlights of chapter 8 through 11. I hope you have a lovely day. Have a good evening. Bye.